Just teasing. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. This is Kristen Vincent, chair of the Westboro School Committee. Today is Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. The meeting of the Westboro School Committee is called to order. Please stand if you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Republic for which it stands. All right, thank you for joining us this evening. I'd like to notify everyone in the room with us tonight that this meeting is being recorded by Westboro TV. School committee meetings are available for remote viewing or listening on Westboro TV's government channels, Verizon, Verizon 28 and Charter 192, and online on the Westboro TV YouTube channel. And thank you to Westboro TV for covering the broadcast tonight. We have with us at this meeting Superintendent Amber Bach, Assistant Superintendent, Dr. Daniel Mayer, Director of Finance and Administration, David Gordon, Vice Chair of the Westboro School Committee, Steve Durrett, School Committee members, Sarah Dule, Lisa Edinburgh, and Raghu Nandan, uh, Recording Secretary, Jen Benton, and we have staff from Westboro TV who are here. We are going to begin with an approval of, oh, sorry, I'll run through the agenda. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna, we'll begin with an approval of minutes from February 16th and also from February 9th, a joint meeting we had with the Advisory Finance Committee. Then we'll have the superintendent's report, the assistant superintendent's report, director of finance and administration's report. Then we'll have school committee member reports, building project updates, citizens requests. Then we'll have a COVID update. We'll have an update on a middle school football program. We will hear about the final draft of the strategic plan, and we will do a budget update and town meeting preparation. Um, and there's no need for an executive session tonight, so we'll adjourn after that. So we will begin with an approval of minutes. First, we'll start with the minutes from February 16th, 2022 regular session. I move the motion to approve the minutes. Thank you, Rago. Second. Thank you, Steve. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, all those in favor? No opposed, so those are approved. And then um, we have minutes from our joint meeting from February 9th with the Westboro Advisory Finance Committee. Um, and uh, I need to propose an amendment to those minutes um, just because it had the date uh, 2021, and so I would amend that we move it to 2022. Um, so I would approve, uh, make, I would make a motion to approve amended minutes from February 9th. So move. There you go. Any other discussion about those minutes? Only that a lot was discussed. Yeah, I thought that captured, it was, it, it was captured. a bullet list, but it captured a lot of ranging topics that we covered. Yeah. Sure. Yep. Yep. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Okay, thanks. Um, so I will share those back to the Westboro Advisory Finance Committee and let them know that we approved amended minutes and let them take it from there. So I'm gonna turn the meeting over to our superintendent. Excellent, good to see everybody. Um, we are on the Wednesday after the return from vacation, which always feels um, a little celebratory. And um, we are usually on the ground out and about meeting people and getting into classrooms and buildings to welcome people back. Daniel and I have been um, really, and Sherry Stevens in particular, the three of us in a lot of classrooms and buildings this week to see how people were post vacation. I just feel like the energy was very positive, both students and faculty feeling rested and an opportunity to um, get a second wind coming back into this next phase of the year. And there was a lot going on. It was community reading day at Armstrong, and that was exciting. And a lot of people have uh, some welcome back assemblies planned in person. And this week, which feels again like an important transitional change that people are excited about. Um, and I, I think there was just an overall feeling of um, a positive return. So there's lots of other good things to report on. I'll save the other updates for my COVID transition updates when I do a brief update on that. And I know Daniel has an update on DEIJ work and just things we've been doing that you wanted to comment on as well. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Um, 
So we are um, actively preparing for our professional development day next week, which is going to be, there'll be a, a focus during a few hours during that day on um, equity and inclusion topics. Um, we're going to have uh, the consultant, Eliza Tullison, who um, has uh, worked already with the leadership team and also our department heads. She's going to be presenting for an hour and a half on what it means to um, you know, be aware of your identity in this world and then being an identity conscious educator. Um, and so after an hour and a half of discussion um, and a workshop with her, then we're going to be breaking into over 40 different subgroups to have facilitated discussions where um, they're going to be case studies that are read um, by our teachers and they're um, from a very um, thoughtful book where basically the, each each of the case studies of the different grade levels are specific to the age group and they involve issues that are complicated um, and there's a lot of gray and room for you know there's no right answer but it's how do you how do you address these um, kind of difficult situations that can come up um, with, with uh, race and ethnicity issues and um, and conflicts that may arise. Um, so we're looking forward to it. We have uh, trainings actually for the facilitators uh, happening both tomorrow and on Friday. And um, I look forward to the 700 or so people participating at everybody in the school district is gonna be actively involved in that on Tuesday. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for the update. Um, Dave, do you have anything to share now? Okay. Uh, no update for me tonight. Just okay. uh, <clears throat> preparation for um, town meeting. So uh, we'll follow up at, at the end of the school committee. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, so we'll move into our school committee member report. So we'll start with Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Good evening. Lots of um, MIAA playoffs happening. I yes, know that. I was going to yeah. start off with some <laughs> awesome. sports updates. So. <laughs> Uh, boys hockey having their uh, D2 uh, state uh, state game tonight in Norwood. Uh, girls basketball have their home game this Friday for the D2 championship. Um, and among other things, the debate team is competing in a debate tournament this Saturday at Shrewsbury High School. And Science Olympiad are having their state competition next weekend as well. Um, good luck to all of the people competing in those. Um, they, and also there are a lot of a, a student council class office events coming up. Class of 24, the class of 2024 are planning a dodgeball tournament uh, and um, plans for semi-formal dances, semi-formal prom, uh, a lot of events coming up in the future. Um, and yeah, also a lot of field trips. The students came back from the Galapagos field trip, uh. a lot of fun stories and Instagram posts and a lot of, <laughs> uh, awesome. yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. And there are a couple of field trips planned for the future. There's the junior and uh, junior English class is going to watch a play um, in the future. Um, and there have also been talks, um, the things I mentioned about last meeting about like the history department and things that they're addressing. So. Um, the fact of the matter is there's just like such a large breadth of things that need to be covered in the history curriculum. And so what they're trying to do is to shift from um, like a fa factual based learning to like conceptual based learning, um, like skills such as uh, identifying misinformation, critical thinking, things like that. Um, and yeah, looking to improve that in the future. Um, yeah, uh, Hastings are having their March Book Madness Month, where basically it's like, if you know what March Madness is, it's like that, but with books. <laughs> so they have brackets, and every I think every week they vote uh, on their favorite books, and they advance to the finals, so that's a lot of fun. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, and Fails is collecting personal care items this week for the Westboro Food Pantry, and they'll be ce celebrating their collection efforts this Friday with a Spirit Wear Day. And yeah, that's all I have to report to today. Yeah, yeah, a lot going on, and it's great to hear about all the plans for, you know, events that feel more typical to the high school experience and to all the schools. So thanks for the update. 
Sarah, anything? Um, I do have one update on the Save Browse to School grant. Unfortunately, Westboro was not selected um, for the grant this round. Um, that we also applied in 2019 and were not selected then either, so maybe third time would be the <laughs> charm. But I just want to thank Chris Payne, again, the DBW director, for his time and efforts on the application and everyone who helped out with that. And we can always apply um, again in the future. And we have ongoing work with the Safe Routes to School. Hastings is going to do a walk audit in April. Um, and they're very excited about that over there um, and do an arrival and dismissal audit as well. So, because um, I know that parking lot can get, get a little dicey. So, um, we're looking forward to that. Um, since this is my last meeting, um, I feel like I'm ending with a few things that made me want to be a part of the committee to begin with. I was happy to um, read at Armstrong today. Um, I was a community reader in a third grade class for Read Across America Day. Um, we made bookmarks related to the theme of the book, and I was asked by two students to sign their bookmark, and I got a hug. Oh. Um, so that was very rewarding. And then also I just um, did an interview uh, with a high school student for a project on civic engagement, and it was totally engaging and motivating. So um, thank you for um, spending time with me on my last at my last meeting um, and the highlight of my time in the school committee is always the graduations especially the many times when I was able to personally congratulate um, each and every student as they walked across the field um, with their diplomas and with all that is going on in the world today I'm feeling grateful um, that we all as a community for everything that we're able to give our students um, from our community um, thank you to everyone that's helped me along this journey, something I never thought I would do. Um, the work is never done, but I'm feeling fortunate that I could serve my community with all of you. And I'm going to stop because my family is looking forward to me not crying on Westboro <laughs> TV anymore. <laughs> but again, hopefully. Um, and maybe I'll start making dinner again on Wednesday nights. <laughs> well, we want to say thank you for all the years of service you've put in onto the school committee. So we have a few things for you. It's tradition. <laughs> Sarah, I told you, I'm, st I'm hoping to get this gift someday. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm staying, Bigger one. hoping to survive enough contracts to get this gift. You and Steve need, like, Steve the king size. Yeah. <laughs> Do I get a blanket? Yeah. Of course you got a blanket. So it's a tradition, if someone leaves school committee, they get a W blanket. There you go. <laughs> That's so All exciting. Right. We deserve we need to wrap up blanket. blanket. And? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> and um, I do have a few things to say, so hopefully it won't make you cry. Oh. Um, so I just want to thank you so much for your service on the school committee um, and for leading our school committee as chair for over two years. Um, I know your term was as chair was unexpectedly extended because the town elections in 2020 were postponed, so I appreciated that you stayed on even longer um, through the school shutdown in March as COVID-19 impacted our community. Um, but during your time on the school committee, you helped lead the district and the community through so many like major changes and updates and improvements, um, including, this was a really long list. Mm. <laughs> um, Construction of the new early childhood building at Hastings, an expansion at Armstrong, so moving from trailers parked out back attached to the building to like actual classrooms back there. Um, renovations at Hastings that are still happening, um, uh, overhaul of Gibbons and, and kids going to school while the renovations were happening everything for a Steve few did, years. But okay. <laughs> um, a new track stadium, two new turf fields, and lights that probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for all your work on Rangers on track for fundraising. Um, the establishment of the borough program and opening of the Sugar Shack, which I know you're a frequent customer. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, the teacher unit A contract negotiations. You're definitely key and pivotal to that, especially with your um, snack providing on those unit negotiations um, and all your fundraising work from the turkey trot and your recent uh, work on safe routes to school and the opening of a new fails school you were there from the start of that when it you know arrived as an idea on paper um, so sorry you're a joy to know and work with and your baking and snack providing skills are exemplary um, and I know you prefer to stay behind the scenes, so I know that stepping up to serve on the school committee and, uh, and to even take the role of chair for a few years was outside of your comfort zone, but I'm grateful for your bravery <laughs> to step up as a leader in our community and our district is a better place because of you. So thank you. Thank you I so agree. much.
know if anyone has anything Like else. I said, I'm not going anywhere. I know I'm you're still not going to do the turkey trot. She's like, I'll be more help behind the scenes. <laughs> so, yeah. It is pretty amazing. I just want to say it's been such an honor Aww. to be beside you along the way. And I can't imagine not being. So your phone will still be ringing and <laughs> I will still be asking for advice. I am going to change my phone number. <laughs> <laughs> I know oh. where you live. <laughs> I laud that very long list of great contributions that you made, but the town probably doesn't really remember or realize that you raised probably close to a million dollars in gifts during your period of time that you were in the, yeah. on the school committee. With a lot of help. <laughs> well, that may be, but you were certainly the, the uh, agent that uh, made it all happen, and I think the town is much better place as a result of your service on the school committee. And I thank you personally. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for everything that you have done. I'm relatively new, but <laughs> I remember when I joined the school committee, um, you are the chair, and uh, you are interviewing me. And uh, I remember talking during the interview. It was much of an encouragement than literally questioning. <laughs> so, so I was. Uh, you started out. I want to interview, and I'm like, okay, this is going to be more of a question and answer type. This was nothing like that. So, <laughs> appreciate that, and uh, and it's it's been going on ever since. Uh, you've been a helping hand and learn, helped me learn the ropes real quick. And I remember that. That missed. was that was when we did the interviews, and um, I plucked your paper out of there, and I was like, I'm going to call this guy. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate thank you it all. so much, Sarah. Yeah, mm -hmm. you will be missed. Yeah, I just wanted to say, um, when I first walked into this room, as like at the end of junior year, it was very intimidating. <laughs> but uh, just having you as a friendly face, just walking here, being very open, kind, and friendly, that was uh, a great uh, relief to me <laughs> in front of everyone. And this is just, I haven't even been on here for a year. Um, but just having, just being here, being to be able to talk to you has just been a real pleasure. So thank you for all your time. We put the sweetest, kindest person right next to the student. No, I love, like I love the student rep. We're like, we bumped her right down the table to you, Andrew. I love the student rep. I think I can name yeah. all of them. I'll be there at your graduation. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. She'll be there. Yep, definitely. It is such a huge amount of work. I think we don't talk about the volume of work and commitment and energy and focus it takes to serve on a school committee and to step up to not just the stress and anxiety of feeling yourself in the public view during probably one of the most incredibly stressful phases of leadership, certainly that I have ever uh, experienced. And I think your steady presence and your capacity to be forgiving and to frame things from a perspective of kindness while you lead with strength is an amazing gift. And your ability to embrace all perspectives with a voice that's so kind while also having your own authority is just a rare combination in leadership. So I have found it a joy to have you on the board and I will definitely miss you and you are not changing your phone number. <laughs> um, but, but I think we know that for somebody who's such a public servant, I do know that you'll be here and I know that in Westboro your impact will continue. So I look forward to see where you emerge next and we'll see you at the turkey trot and all those other things. So, thank you very much, Sarah. And um, just to let everyone know, watching, um, if you are unaware, um, we all serve different, well, we all serve a three-year term, but we're all up for election at different times. So um, this is the year where Steve Durrett and Sarah DeLay are up for re-election, and Steve is running for re-election, and Sarah decided not to. He was glutton for punishment. <laughs> and I do want to acknowledge that Stephen Batchelor is here uh, in our audience tonight. Um, and he is on the ballot for election. So hi, Steve. Thanks for joining welcome, us. Welcome, Steve. And um, we welcome him. Um, Steve, it, it's very convenient that it's Stephen and Stephen on the ballot. <laughs> and um, they are, you know, as of today, running unopposed. So we welcome, you know, Stephen to our, um, our school committee and look forward to working with you. So thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that is a reminder that elections are on March 8th, um, and we definitely encourage you to come out and um, vote and say hi to everyone volunteering all day at the 
um, at the elections. It's just a fun to, to say hi and see everyone there. And also to remind you that town meeting is March 19th at 9 a.m. at the high school. And um, we'll be sharing more about town meeting in our agenda yep. later tonight. Great. Uh, Lisa, do you have any other updates? For I, there was one, especially. Um, I wanted to mention that um, the Commissioner of Department of Education and Secondary Education announced that Westboro Public Schools will receive a FY22 proficiency-based outcomes in languages other than English grant. Westboro Public Schools will receive $11,940 to collect and analyze data pertaining to proficiency in languages other than English. This grant pr program is one of the ways that DESE, D -E -S -E, supports world language, heritage language, dual language, and English language learners programs across school districts in the Commonwealth. Congratulations to Westboro Public Schools. Yeah. Just wanted to give a shout out <laughs> to our district. Yeah, Hannah Kane had an, one of our reps had announced that on yeah. Facebook, so that was nice. nice. Yeah. Very exciting. Yeah. It, it, they announced it before telling us in, yeah. in, internally <laughs> here. And I, think, I was like, I think wow, it was, that's nice. I don't think that's come down the pipeline yet. Yeah, it was, I it's was like, like breaking I, I knew, news. I knew that Bobby <laughs> Sullivan like applied for the grant, but yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. But that's good. Good. Our Be grant quiet. writing, Bobby our grant is, writing skills have grown immensely in the last couple of years. We have people stepping up to really do that's great. And Bobby watches our school committee meetings, so good job, Bobby. Bobby. Incorporate that into his update. That's coming. I know. Us. Good yeah. job, Lisa. So that'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Raghu. Did you have anything to update? Yes. Um, this Friday will be. I, I will be in a call with uh, Peter uh, from Sustainability Westboro mm -hmm. with a. A uh, company called um, Highland Fleet Services. They do electric buses, and um, and uh, there's a there's a uh, the the federal infrastructure bill has. Um, I don't want to misquote, so I don't know how many billions of dollars or <laughs> millions of dollars left um, for electric school buses, oh, yeah. school buses especially. Uh, it kind of makes sense because. Um, uh, you know, they get charged during the night times when the electricity is being produced by the, uh, but it's not consumed. And at the end of the line, it just is grounded because that's the way it works, I suppose. Um, it gets charged during the night and it gets used during the day. Um, so uh, the first question before I joined this meeting was, uh, you know, is there a budget impact? And uh, they assured me because of the grant that there is, they could match or beat the existing mileage rate. Um, so for one bus per school district, that's what it states. Um, so we need to uh, know more about it. I'll be joining this call Friday, three to five, um, and learning more as an exploratory call. Uh, but uh, I would also ask, um, somebody to take a look at the uh, contract we have with NRT to see, you know, before we proceed to the next steps mm -hmm. to see if the contract allows us to bring in a bus like that. If not, we'll have to wait till the contract expires so yeah. that it will be the next steps for me. But this call is just an exploratory call to learn yep. what it all entitles. So that's why. Great. Yeah, yeah. You'll actually see when I update you on the strategic plan that there's a structure in there for looking at putting together a committee to start to work on the feasibility before our next contract. So well-timed update. Yeah, that's great. And I'm sure NRT is already, you know, I'm sure bus companies are already exploring that yeah, yeah. option as well as, as but, that technology grows. Yeah, uh, th th this is outside of, this is a yeah, yeah, yep. company yeah. in its own, it provides, it's own. one bus. One and uh, they, they take care of as a getting trial, a grant, uh, yeah. Yeah. grant from, so. Yeah, that's great. Cool. I'm sure they'll collect a lot of research on it once yeah. they get the buses in different communities. That's why it needs a committee. Yeah, well. that's great. Thank you. Um, Steve, do you have updates? you want to just move into building project yeah. updates? I'm good with that. Yeah, I'd like to move into the building projects. And actually, okay. I want to follow up on what Regu just oh, said. Oh, sure. Um, as of today, our solar panels on top of the failed school produced 100 megawatt hours. That's 100,000 kilowatt hours. Most homes use about 500 kilowatt hours during a month. 
Um, and because of the structure, the way the energy uh, has been purchased historically in Westboro, at this point in time, we're going to have excess energy available, electric energy available, because of the way we set up fails being uh, net metering. And so what happens is the excess generation is becomes a dollar credit on the power bill for the schools. Um, one of the things that's built into the FAILS project are two uh, electric plug-in um, stations. The conduit is there, but the stations have not been um, purchased yet. So with the excess generation, in effect, we'll be able to supply, in effect, uh, free energy mm -hmm. if we end up with buses. Yeah. And it's something that uh, I've suggested a number of years running, that we should pay attention to the alternative fuels um, that in the past were available, such as, <clears throat> excuse me, compressed natural gas for a bus, or, or in this case, electric buses, because it, it appears that the feds are going to subsidize electric buses, and for that matter, other vehicles that the town might be able to buy. And so um, at, at this stage of the game, uh, remember that uh, the solar system went online about the middle of November. And so since that time, we've created 100 megawatt hours or 100,000 kilowatt hours. As of today, um, based on the day that we had, we used about 46% of the generation of the solar generation today with the excess being put onto the, the grid. Unfortunately, as of this time, we haven't all the metering wiring done. It's supposed to be done by this Friday since we've been promised that many times. But anyway, <laughs> hopefully it gets done and then the full credit um, that of what's going on in terms of solar generation will benefit the town. And so, uh, meanwhile, because it is winter and the ground is frozen and we really don't want to make a mess of the site uh, any more than what we already had done uh, until the snow is gone and the ground thaws, uh, work will start again on the lower uh, field and the rest of the project will be completed and knock on wood sometime um, before the middle of June. So with that, um, everything else is quiet and um, and nothing bad has happened recently. So. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, does anyone have any questions for Steve about his building project updates? I saw there was a nice article about the update you did at the last meeting on the fails gymnasium floor in the community oh, I advocate. Can, oh, yeah, I can speak to that. Oh, sure. Um, <laughs> it's all been put back together again. The uh, uh, the uh, logo that was damaged has been repainted. Um, the uh, areas of the floor that were in distress have been recoded uh, and sealed. Uh, the baseboards are put back together, and so it's uh, back in full use. Uh, for any programs that we have. Um, we have received from the insurance company 100% coverage of what the damage was in our own costs. Um, we'll receive a report from the insurance company shortly, and uh, that money will be returned to the town. And I assume because the, um, the insurance payments come out of the town side of the budget, that's where the money will go. But um, at least the town as a whole hasn't been damaged by this problem. And we had a report today from the architect in terms of the program to modify the, the drainage course on that side of the, of the building and um, also a design for a, let's call it a barrier wall um, around the slab that I spoke of and further that the slab itself that's there will be removed in a trench drain at the threshold will also be installed so that, and then finally, there'll be a, an awning uh, over the doorway so that uh, rainfall, even on the slab, won't happen. <laughs> so, you know, it's a live and learn story, but um, I'm glad that we learned it now rather than later. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, yep. definitely. Yeah, that's great. Quick fix and we'll, yeah, move on there. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to move on to citizens' requests, and just for anyone here tonight or anyone watching, uh, this is a portion of the meeting that um, we invite anyone um, to, who's visiting to um, 
join us up here and uh, address the school committee. And um, I just want to remind about our policy for citizens' requests. Um, some important pieces of the policy that you must be a current resident of Westboro. Um, each speaker will be allowed up to three minutes to speak to the school committee. Speakers are allowed to address the school committee about issues within the school committee's purview. So mostly that's our budget and policy. Um, and that public comment by residents is not a discussion or a debate between individuals and the school committee. It's an individual's opportunity to express an opinion on issues within the school committee's authority. And our role is to listen carefully to what you have to share with us. Um, is there anyone who'd like to address the school committee tonight? Boyd, you want to come up? And you just have to s state your name and street address when you get in front of the microphone. Boyd Conklin. Uh, 8 Water Street. And uh, so uh, back on 2-8 uh, at the school committee meeting, uh, we had uh, Maeve Hidson-Buell was uh, touted out the teaching materials uh, for the English language learners. And uh, Kristen had stated previously at another meeting that there, were, there was no CRT critical race theory being taught uh, at Westboro. And so looking at, uh, looking at the, uh, the books that Maeve uh, touted out, um, White Fragility by D'Angelo, How to Be Anti-Racist by Kendi, Between the World and Me, Coates, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria, Tatum, and Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents, Wilkinson. Uh, these to me are critical race theory, the, the texts of critical race theory. Um, so I look at uh, critical race theory as Marxist ideology rewritten using race instead of class, where the whites are the bourgeoisie and the ethnics are the proles. And um, taking a sideline on the uh, the masking and the vaccines and the vaccine uh, sets set up for, at the schools to have the kids getting vaccinated. I see the Biden administration, the governors, the selectmen, board of health, school committee, school superintendent following lockstep of the CDC and the NIH dictates. I don't see you guys having any say at all. You're just following what's being pushed down the ladder. And uh, I see Big Pharma as running what the CDC and the NIH are telling everybody. I see you guys in the school committee in order to get the ESSER grants, one, two, and three, and the COVID relief grants, get that money. I see you guys complying lockstep with, with their dictates. I see the system has silenced institutions of science like MIT, Harvard, doctors, hospitals, and scientism has taken over the science on the, on the problems with the vaccine, the blood clots, the myocarditis, and everything else that's happening. Um, it, all the numbers, when the insurance companies are coming up with 40% death rates over year over year, in this last year when the vaccines came out, the information gets immediately suppressed. No questioning of the political media big tech monopoly of information. I think I got my three minutes in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Anyone else want to address the school committee? Okay. We'll move on to our COVID update. Thank so you. Back, back to me. Yep. So um, tonight I have a couple of specific updates, not a long report. I think it speaks to where we are in transition um, back to more normalcy of practice. You've seen that CDC has updated guidelines. You've seen that the town and local areas are all shifting practices. Um, we have made adjustments as well and moved forward with all of those uh, changes and recommendations. Um, on Monday, we began flex masking pre-K to 22. Um, all of our buildings seem to have moved forward with that um, seamlessly. We've been able to visit buildings. And I would say this week in my travels, I've been to four of the six buildings this week. Um, they are uh, flexibly masking. We have a, a mix of like 
like when I was at Armstrong, probably a lot of the third grade wasn't masking, second grade a mix, some classrooms mix, a lot of kindergartners still mixed. Like they, you know, it was just kind of a, um, a general flow of choice. I would say that um, faculty as well are shifting into their areas of personal choice. Um, and uh, it looked like it was moving smoothly. Um, I was able to visit with kids in the hallway and just in a whole range of transitions as well as classrooms and things looked comfortable and um, people seemed very happy in the sense of the, as I said earlier, the environment being positive and kids looking rested and faculty seeming well. I found that replicated at uh, the other buildings I visited as well. I uh, was able to be at Mill Pond, I was able to be at Hastings, the preschool uh, and Gibbons. So. Uh, <clears throat> seeing the transition we anticipated. I think we will see, um, again, a continual gradual shift in practice as people get more comfortable with making that choice. I think it's a big change for people. It's a, you know, students, especially younger students, you know, are um, compliant by nature in that sense in that they kind of follow typical rules and they've had all these rules and now we're flexing those rules for them and giving them space to adjust. Um, and I think they're taking that space and time to adjust, which is exactly what we would have expected and are supporting. Um, I think families need to continue to have conversations with their children and make sure that they feel comfortable um, with how school is going, and that's our goal. I'm very excited to see the happy, smiling faces of kids that I got to see today visiting around, as well as faculty. And I was in Hastings, and there was this row of first graders that went by, and a bunch of them were telling Julia Degata, the principal, they had never seen her face <laughs> in oh person. Gosh, so and cute. one of the little girls goes, that's what you look like? It was like <laughs> so cute. And we were all kind of laughing and talking about it. And she's like, well, you saw me on Zoom. She goes, yeah, but it's like so different in person, right? So it was just kind of this beautiful moment where, and, and then all the kids started chattering about times they had seen her face. And there was this discussion <laughs> about it. So, you know, there was just this general sense of, um, I think positive celebration in a good way, and and you know it was um, very normal, and that felt really good, and and um, I think you'll see that across this week, and I think that will be part of what is transition, and people should give everyone space, um, students need space and faculty space to just kind of move through the week. I think you know certainly um, we're still ahead of the curve on most districts. Um, a lot of districts are still waiting another two weeks. We've moved forward, we feel good about that. Encourage everyone to just keep taking the steps forward that they feel work for them. Um, I would indicate too that in our transition with moving to pre-K to sixth grade, adding in those other buildings, we had three accommodations that we made. Similarly, when we did accommodations at Gibbons in the Middle School to eat for, either, for either student medical needs or faculty medical needs, we had three accommodations that we made across those schools. So again, a very small number. I think they've been navigated successfully and people feel supported um, on both sides for the need for that and the need for flex from it. Um, I would note as well that um, if you're home testing, our home testing protocols, all the boxes arrived today, they packed, they went out today. If you opt out of the program, if you quit using those tests and you are not testing and you're not picking them up and you're not using them or you're picking them up and they're stacking up at home, please go on and fill out the form and opt out of the program because it's cumbersome for us. It's not, you know, I think people get very comfortable with things arriving in the mail, right? It's not that easy. We have to order those tests. You know, in our office, Andrea and I and Donna are packing those and then they're picked up and delivered. And it is a mechanic of effort between three or four people. So it isn't seamless and I think it's important to one, acknowledge a thank you to those people, the maintenance people that are delivering them, the secretaries who are helping disperse them, and Andrea who does the weekly orders and boxes and unboxes with Donna's help. So I think just to message to people out there, faculty or staff and, um, and parents, if you decide to move away from that program, please go on and use the form and it's, it's on the website or you can call your school and they'll send it to you, opt out of the program and we'll, we'll quit ordering for you. Okay. It, it might be worth in a couple of weeks just sending a yeah, reminder. Yeah, we probably will. We link. can do that, just, you know, in the next week. Feelings um, are going to change about it, so. And then, um, and again, we still have a good participation rate, but I just think it's important not to be cumbersome with things we don't need. If people opt out, that's fine. But you need to let us know. Can, can we go to a program where people request instead of opting in and uh, 
opt but you out can opt in or order. opt out but we yeah. can't yeah. flex the and we can't flex the order it's pretty it's pretty set so they they the state has a clear requirement that you either are in or out so when they do our counts it's not week by week but anyone can join at any time anyone can join at any time so yes they can change their mind and want back in later and sign up and get one in that next weekly cycle so if they've stacked up five or six and they want to opt out and then opt back in they could do that yes it has that flexibility i'm certainly not looking for that to be like <laughs> it's not an easy rotation. I oh, mean, yeah. Andrea has to do those counts, submit all the documents, they have to send them to us. So I want to provide flexibility for people. What I want is, are you using them or not? Use them if you have them. If you don't, don't. And let's just keep it, you know, in a way that streamlines it so we can serve your needs and provide what you, what you need in order to feel safe, protected, and to screen. But let's make sure that you just keep track of it. I know I'm busy and I could just like get them and stack them up and not be paying attention and then be like, oh, I have seven of these things. If, that, if you get to that place, then I would say opt out and if you want them back in, you know, you could, you could do that. Because that's 14, that's 14 weeks if you have seven boxes sitting in your house. Now, you shouldn't be that far in. We haven't been doing it that long. But. So I, I was asked a couple, by a couple of parents According to the frequently asked questions, the 90 day, if you had COVID. You should not be testing. You should not be testing for the first 90 days after. Right. So if you've been collecting tests up to the night, you're gonna have enough by the time the program ends. <laughs> you're done. For a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think again, it's not like a crisis for us or anything. I'm just mentioning it while I'm doing a COVID update to just be self-aware. And I know that we often are speaking to an array of people during this time. So yeah, I'm mentioning it. it. It's all good and things we feel are going well. Um, so flex masking moving forward, accommodations in place, home testing in place. And the last piece is that the CDC has removed guidelines for busing and public transportation requiring special accommodations of masking. So I will push out a notification tomorrow shifting buses to optional masking, and that will match where we are across district with both buildings and buses. And I would do that in the morning if you're comfortable with that. I just wanted to, I've already spoken to NRT and they'll shift when we put out a notice and tell us it's fine. I know like I think Shrewsbury and a couple of the places they work with are like next week or the week after. So I said that if we're good, I'll put out a note tomorrow and you know, I can add about the home testing info and push that tomorrow. Sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. fine. Thank you. Yep. Um, that's my update on COVID. I, I felt a sense of joy to be able to see a transition towards um, choice and kids' faces and teachers' faces. And I have to say the energy on the ground has been really good. Thank you. Yep. Um, we're going to move to our next agenda item, the middle school football program. And I'm yeah, so I'm this. providing this update for Johanna DiCarlo tonight because she is at the hockey game, which is where she should be. I would love to be at the hockey game. Um, but I'm happy to be here as well. But um, so I'm going to provide an overview and, and just take uh, questions. I think her memo is very clear. So it's, it's an opportunity to, and if Daniel, if you could pull that up, the memo up. Um, so over the last couple of years, we've continued to look at, I think, you know, again, athletic uh, programs like anything else need dynamic renewal and changes and matching to where we are in the tempo of, of the kind of the, the, the culture of any of the sports that we have, and they're all different. And with football, you've seen over the last several years a decline in numbers. You've seen some people shifting away from tackle. You've seen some people holding their kids out longer. And then you see people that are really interested in a robust program. So it has kind of that full bell curve. Um, during the last several seasons, though, we've been talking, I've been talking with Johanna about this for probably two years. Um, a little earlier, um, wanting to look at, you know, currently um, the football is supported by the AYF. It's the independent um, team-based sports like team soccers and club soccers and things like that. Um, so it's a community-based football program. It's been fabulous for years and years. 
amazing parents and great experiences for kids. We all have, you know, many people have very fond feelings of, of all of those stages. And it has a robust program coming through the younger years. When we hit seventh and eighth grade, they've seen a fall off in that level of programming. And so one of the things we've been talking about with them is that they would keep the arm of their younger based um, teams and we would move in the direction of our own um, Gibbons Ranger middle school seventh and eighth grade team. And what we believe is that it would give us an opportunity to do a lot of exciting things, which is one, to create a culture where our high school football players and coaches and the experience of coming up to the high school to practice on the upper field and to be able to play some games and to be able to, to train near and with the other teams and some overlap and exciting ways to just kind of feel that football experience, we get a chance to one, train them carefully to make sure that it's safe. We get a chance to build culture we get a chance to get to know the kids and encourage them to continue in their playing path through high school. Um, and so that feels like a level of excitement that lets us continue to work with the AYF football program as their younger players are thriving and then bring them into the feeder program that would become the Gibbons team at seventh and eighth grade. Um, so one of the things that I think would allow, and so we had talked about doing it a year ago, but then there was a change in um, leadership at the AYF and they had a new like lead person come on and they wanted to give it another year to see what they felt about it before relinquishing the seventh and eighth grade program. So I think the coaches, our coaches and Johanna just continued conversations and at this point feel like for the next school year, we're ready to move forward with our own program. Um, the logistics of it are pretty well laid out. Um, in, in framework, we've done this in a couple other settings. Um, currently, we haven't had enough players to run a JV1 and a JV2. So what we would do is shift the funding allocation and the coaching funding to take that JV2 and shift it to be allocated to basically the middle school team, which would kind of become the JV2 team, basically, uh, in terms of a Gibbons middle school experiential team. We'll keep it very focused on middle school framework. It's not like we're going to throw them into high school football. It's a middle school-based experience, but within a framework where they can see the trajectory and interact and come up to the high school and, and be up there where we can, you know, we've got training there and things like that so they get good care and a chance to really provide an experience. Um, logistically, so then the budget would be neutral. Um, Schedule-wise, they would not, one of the benefits for families is actually they start a little later. So, um, which I think is actually a benefit. And one of the problems with them maybe losing kids as they get busier and they're traveling and doing other things, they wouldn't start until school starts. And then they would play through the first uh, week or two weeks in November. So usually, I think that's a two-week differential. So they don't have to come back as early. So middle schoolers and families, they get their summer, then they come back and then they would start. Um, the schedule would then allow them to do weeks one and three. They would start one through three like with a camp clinic style experience where they would be really getting fundamentals, get them acclimated, get them in equipment. We have equipment for them. We're making purchases. We did some pre-purchasing last year thinking we might move forward and then we've, we'll be adding uh, more to that using uh, funds that, that Johanna already has. And they really want to look on learning fundamentals and settling into a system. From there, they would do weeks four through nine. They would practice three days a week and then have one game. So it's a very nice structure. I think it holds on to the best of the experience that kids were having with AYF while it creates a framework for us to expand the team and have more kids for them to interact with and to be able to provide a robust experience. Um, you can see the notes there about the, the um, facilities and the busing. They would take the first wave over from Gibbons. Daniel, and then can you just slide that? Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. sorry, sorry, I'm moving That's along. Okay. Okay. Um, so so they, they would basically, they would take the first wave of buses over to the high school, all right, when they would change in our visiting team locker rooms, they use the same field and time as the varsity and JV teams. So they can use all the football equipment that's at the high school. Yeah. Too. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, I think the high school team is really excited as well because it gives them opportunities to see the breadth of their program, you know, uh, as well, getting getting um, opportunities to expand. Um, 
There have been many neighboring towns that have adopted the same type of approach, so we will have a team schedule to play, and I think she's already developed that. She'd be happy to come back in the, so two pieces. Johanna will come back in the fall and report on progress and implementation, give you numbers in terms of participation. We'll do some surveying, figure out how we're doing, and just kind of like give you feedback. Um, and then move forward with kind of monitoring its implementation and making sure that we're pleased with how it's going. So um, that is where we are right now. I'm very excited about this. Um, I think it lets the younger players really see what the experience would be for them if they keep the trajectory of participation. So um, that's where it stands right now. It falls under all the MIAA regulations. So it's Westboro Middle School, Gibbons students who can play on the team. And they're the participants we will draw from. And uh, we're excited to see it take off. Can I ask you a couple of questions? Sure. If one, I don't know, I might need to text okay. Joe and get back to you, but go ahead. No, I get that. Um, one is, there was a lot of talk, when we were talking about the fields and playing practices and the need for the second field, you know, way back, there was a lot of discussion about making sure it was fair and who had time. By adding a team to practice over at the high school, is this taking away from any other team to practice? And that's one of my questions. Yeah, yeah. The other is, how do we know we have enough interest if the purpose of not having a seventh and eighth grade team in the past led you to this other program, but you're coming back to the program? Is it because we know that there's an interest at the seventh and eighth grade level or a hope that there is an interest in this? I think we feel like when we're sponsoring the team, we can get a broader um, interest in... So there's two things, which is... And Sarah looks like she was going to add in... And, um, and I'm like... Um, one of the things that happens is you have students who don't, if you, if you haven't come through that trajectory of AYF, you might not know that you could add in. You don't, you might move into town and not even know, but when we sponsor a team at a, at a school level, we reach every seventh and eighth grader, we throw the doors wide, we're like, we want you, come play football, you can do that with us, and it's, it's a school activity. So it has a different opportunity to bring in new players and students who, by seventh and eighth grade are at the age and stage where they, they might be comfortable adding tackle football into the choice of sports they would make that they deferred when they were younger. And I think there are families who might have waited. We all know Tom didn't start until later in terms of his <laughs> football experience. Um, and that you can come into a sport late in life and do very, very well. And I think there's some culture in sports now where if you don't get in at six, you've, you've missed the boat. And I think you have a lot of kids who don't navigate that messaging or wouldn't even ask to play football. But if you get invited to, you know, come and try, um, I think you'll see that we, we can pick up students who would give it a go. Yeah, I think, so, I think some parents actually tell their kids that they can't play football right, until 7th, 8th, or ninth yeah. grade. Um, so I think there would be more kids interested. And also when I read this, the structure of the program, those first, like, one to three weeks, it, like, where they're learning more and acclimating more and actually learning the sport is going to be very beneficial to this too because if you've never played before you're not just thrown onto a field with a bunch of equipment on so I think that that's a really good good structure for it and in the past the youth football has kind of been on their own um, putting teams together at seventh and eighth grade level like last year they didn't have a seventh and eighth grade any eighth graders playing so they had a sixth and seventh grade team combined which means you can only play at the higher level so they had sixth graders playing against seventh graders I don't know it just yeah. so I think that Johanna has worked with with the you know youth football for a couple of years as Amber said like kind of putting this together and there's kind of mutual benefits the only thing yeah. I would communicate is communicate early yeah. um, because it's change and there will be people right. who are already in the program that have yep. strong well, feelings about def, this yeah but if yep. you communicate it now I think that it could be that's why we sure. wanted to come to you now so she can put the flyer out and put some information out she's talked with Jack and she's you know um, with they she's worked with Jack on this for a while as well um, I also want to make sure that we're really clear that the youth football league is great and that it's full of amazing families that have been like part of the thriving football culture of Westboro and youth sports and commitment to that. And um, we have to have their committed 
trajectory of those young players while we enhance this of drawing in an opportunity to coach new players who might not have added in. And I think that's something where the, you know, the high school coaching team feels like they could have a skill set where working carefully, they know how to bring up a new player who's never played and mix them with a player who's played more and create a team culture that builds that in. And so I think there's things like that that are very exciting. And the field space, sorry, that I think no one is more cognizant of the field space yeah. over there than Johanna. So yeah. I don't think she would even suggest that she yeah. shouldn't have well, the field space. And they also do use half a field. Like right, right now I've seen right. varsities on half, JVs Fs. on half, and they yeah. rotate around and use and different J equipment. Since there's no JV too, it's, I just realized right. as you were saying. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. In the past, we have had a right, freshman yeah. or a JV team yeah, okay. on occasion, so it has worked out. And yeah, I'm, I'm um, obviously fully in support of this. And while, I mean, I, I also love football, I love the range of sports we have, and I think this is, um, we want to, again, it's a blind spot that yep. we look at losing people that don't know how to get in, right? Right, right. And if you come through a trajectory where you've lived in a community a long time and you played and your family fed you into that circuit and it's part of the culture of your family in terms of like you come from a football family or a sport family, you know, my brother started playing football in high school and had never played a sport at all, but he was giant and they just recruited him and he went, but you know, it's, you, you have to be invited at that point, you have to be invited because I don't think sports communicate you can get in anymore sometimes. Um, and I think that's a part of a culture where we want to really make sure that as a district, we're really thoughtful about that. So I'm really excited about this opportunity. Great. Yeah, Andrew, uh, I just yeah. had a question on yeah. the middle school team. Will it be like tryouts where like there will be people cut or will it just be like whoever wants to start? No, all will play. That's okay. a all question. Yeah. Usually um, everyone has a chance oh, okay. to play. Yeah. Be on yeah. the team. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Good question. Yeah. Um, all right. So that's the update. Yeah. I'll tell thank any other to, questions. I'll just or? say thank you to Johanna for putting in all the research and the, the networking. I know it takes a lot of coordination among many groups to bring something like this forward. So I appreciate all yeah. her connections. Thank you. And, thank and you. I'll tell her that, that yeah. she has your support to move forward and you look forward to an update um, yeah. after the season. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I hope a lot of kids show some interest in that. Be great. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, uh, we also again a couple of years ago the Gibbons had voted and they moved to being Rangers as well. So um, everything's in alignment. <laughs> Works really well. That's great. Thanks. All right. Thank All right, you. You're next up on the agenda as well. I am. <laughs> um, I the am. final draft of the strategic plan. So I know you've been working on this. Yes. With everyone's feedback. Yes, thank you. So I I'm going to keep this succinct. I just want to walk you through the timeline of how I'm going to bring it back to you for a final vote. Tonight you're receiving what will be kind of the final working draft in the sense that the content that needs to be in here, I believe, is now folded in as a starting place. And I want to walk you through process. I'm going to show you a couple additions that I've made. Then I'll push this to you um, after this meeting, it's still a live document. I want to I want to walk you through it, and then I'll share the current PDF with you afterwards, so you can see um, what I shared tonight is always going to be codified in the file. And I'm just going to walk you through um, how I'm going to do this. So I'm really thrilled to be at a place where the structure of this next strategic plan is finally starting to crystallize. Um, stabilizing the amount of work we do across this district with a concrete plan and a timeline and a way to hold ourselves accountable and to communicate what we do. For me, you know, in my time here, this is the document that does that work for me and with me. And in leading a big team, um, you know, we have like so many integrated teams and such a diversified leadership model that people are all carrying these projects. So when you look at this document, it feels huge, but it's a document of the work that goes on in a large organization that's serving 4,000 students and, and a bunch of unique and amazing families. So um, that work has to be organized and should be progressing and growing at all times. And for me, that's what this document represents. Um, and so so we are at a place now where by the time you see it in the next meeting, it'll you know be prettied up and ready for a final vote. So let me just explain what I want to do process-wise. First of all, I want to begin by thanking um, faculty and staff who worked at faculty meetings for the other people that provided feedback for the school committee feedback that I received. We had over 200 additional 
really even more than that, comments provided. I think the schools did a really good job to synthesize their comments so they would work in a team and give me singular comments. And then I also provided a document where I got individual comments. And so I then took all of that feedback and then went back across, again, the range of work we had done uh, on leadership team and and moved some additional pieces into the document, and that's what I want to share with you tonight. And I feel like that's the last time that I will be basically moving anything in, and I feel like at this place, I want you to be able to see it as these are all the working things that we believe should be on the docket for discussion. That said, you also know that this is a living, breathing document, and we, we make sure that in a cycle of updating it, we share where we are, and if something needs to be added, we add it and we fold it into the document. So, you're going to see what I'm going to step you through now is basically the final content draft. From here, what will happen will be it will require what we call a polish edit. So it's going to get photos added, the introductory letter, the links will be rechecked, it'll get a close reading, all of the font and, and design elements need to be cleaned up and um, made all the same. It needs the rationales finalized and different people need to write those for me. So I have to wait on getting those and then it needs some formatting. So that's kind of a final polish edit. So I'm gonna walk you through what's been added and then I'll send you the PDF later and between now and the next meeting, you can take a look at it. If you have any questions, you can call me um, or email me or text me. And um, I think they'll make sense to you and, and you'll see them tonight. And then basically when you see the final, final document, I'll be asking you to vote approval to begin implementation. All right, so let me just uh, step you through this. So organizationally, um, in the early sections of teaching and learning and wellness and relationships and community uh, connections and communications, those areas, I did a lot of refining of like wordsmithing, rem removing doubles, uh, doing some other work like that and then adding one or two things in a couple areas and I'm going to highlight those to you and I'll have, I'll call out the pages to Daniel and he can hop us down there. But the main area where I'm going to take you is down to management and operations and facilities because that was the arena that I owned a lot of the finalization on and I had not pulled in some document work that we had done in cabinet and that John Green had done in a couple other pieces. So I want to show you the reflection of those additional pieces. And you remember when I gave you the last document, a lot of those were still looking really, um, really, really sparse. So those are now finalized and I want to step you through those. Before that, I'm just going to call it a sampling. Um, Daniel, if you want to hop down to page 10 just for a minute, if you, oh, actually, it's down in, uh, yeah, just scroll actually. Right and then uh, it's, pro it's in, um, it's actually down in uh, professional, yeah, thank you, just, so down in section 10 there on page 10, yep, if you look at a sample there, just hold there. I did some work on the social studies curriculum implementation with Daniel where we sat down and we had some more talking and um, we, we did um, some additions. I, I added, for example, uh, some discussions around the social studies curriculum, doing uh, more intertwined uh, work with the literacy department that will come through that literacy review. So the social studies review is done, but they need to do some collaboration on aligning some key themes that they tend to echo together. So that was a conversation where we added that. Um, and I wanted to make sure that I just kind of modeled to you with this example, you know, some of the simple but targeted refinement that we did in this edit that I've been working on since you last saw it. So if you look down at the last bullet there, the one underneath that, Daniel, it says explore opportunities to align the social studies to curriculum and key ELA literacy text around shared content and themes. So as an example, those are just, that's the level of refinement where I am now in terms of kind of going into the document and making um, some additions and changes. Um, if you scroll down to page 16, I'm gonna walk you through a couple other pieces. One of the things I also did when we went through feedback, so this is in the section of wellness and relationships. Um, if, if you look at, if you scroll down to the bottom of that page right there, let's see. Um, one of the things that we did some more work on based on feedback, we got feedback that we had done a nice job with the wellness work for our students. And I just think there was a request for kind of some more targeted focused articulation of wellness for 
uh, of faculty and colleagues. So if you scroll down a little bit more, Daniel, you'll pick up because there's a couple more bars down there. Okay, so I added a couple of things. We talked about kind of, I worked with Roger and went back into the notes. Um, we added that work around really exploring more cross-referencing of faculty and providing more diverse options to bring together different groups across buildings and embedding wellness activities during breaks and some other stuff that we just kind of enhanced that target goal and put a little bit more effort into defining some of the pieces of that work. Um, when I send you this document, you'll see, like, again, those types of refined changes. Also got feedback on a couple areas where um, staff felt that, um, I, you know, they were in the wrong spot, so I would cut a goal and move it. So there was a lot of careful look at that level, which is why you'll need a f clean final draft of kind of the content piece. Um, from there, um, I'm going to take you down to, uh, and again, I did some refining similarly on pages 26 and 30 and 32, but if you take down to third, page 30, Daniel. Um, in that section, I did some work, and again, this is pretty refined at this point in that, okay, hold right there, scroll to the top, are you on page 30, let me just see. I think you are, go up a little, okay, right there. So um, in section 30, um, if you scroll down to that bottom goal, Dave and I did some work, not the HR one, right there, there's a new goal. Um, right there, that new one that we wanted to look at, which is leverage the new leadership of the Director of Finance and Administration to innovate business office functions. Um, so Dave and I really hadn't had a chance to sit down and kind of have a conversation around some of the work he started that he wants to finalize that you've heard him articulate here. And so, you know, he was able to just kind of um, discuss areas where he's got things at play that I want to make sure that we capture in this work. Um, again, he's working with the cabinet team to chase the workflow and shifts in work function with the rest of the cabinet team, and we'll bring that to, to fruition, you know, by the middle of next year. Um, looking at the formatting of the content of the budget book, which you told you he did some initial looks at, but I think wants to do more with, so that would be a next year task. And then looking at working with Scott uh, Henderson, the data architect, for ways to really automate and streamline as many processes as we can, um, and doing some more teamwork in those areas. So I'm, I'm just really happy with the framework of the direction of the integration of the HR department and the business department and, and just the direction where I think this work is going to go. And then I worked with um, Tammy Costello up above. If you look at that goal, if you scroll back, the HR goal, which is a pretty robust goal around a lot of basically all the automated tasks that we need to do. And you can see that she and I, we played with the language, we coordinated it better and streamlined some of the content in that section. I feel like it represents her voice and Suzanne had crafted the majority of those. And so we refined them against both her understanding of those goals, because she owns them. So I wanted to make sure that she had a chance to go back in and read them carefully and modify. And, and we basically consolidated a couple of them and did some good work around understanding each of those um, so that they can be focused on by her um, with the team, okay? So that's the kind of work that I needed time to sit down and do and pull in the final feedback of um, different people. And again, we had over 200 plus additional comments that have to be given the valid, and that's what we wanted. We wanted good feedback. It needs to be owned by everyone. And so I was really, just shout out to the faculty, the amount of good focus they put on it and, and the energy of comments they gave us back were positive and um, a lot of excitement, but also some really good questions and, and some thoughts around areas that we had missed. So I was able to come back in and I think, you know, honor those um, areas of interest. So I'm going to have you go down to the facilities section, Daniel, where I'm going to take the last part of this presentation to give you a sense of an area where we actually do have a good amount of changing. What page um, do you want to be on? What? It's what down page? There. Uh, bottom, just keep going. You'll see the W and then you'll hit it right there. Okay. So I want to, we're going to scroll through this whole section because I think it's important to note, like this is, um, these were, these were very, um, sparse. I needed more work on these and I, I literally was missing a piece of the cabinet document where Sherry had put the borough program notes that she'd had and John had two sections of notes on cap 
project and climate work, so they're all in here now. They're not like crafted by me sitting in my office. They're, they're from teams and I have worked to refine those. So the first would be, this was in here in some work and it was mostly a high school goal. It's been reframed so that it's clearly a district goal around outdoor learning spaces. So then if you just scroll down a little bit. So this looks at the green sustainability goal across district. The first goal is, is outdoor learning spaces. And we look at having a committee for K3 to actually see that they're integrated in for use and care, um, implementing outdoor gardens uh, and working with community people and making sure that the spaces actually have a culture and flexibility for use at the schools. So that's work that has been kind of flushed out a little bit that I think it makes it more robust than just the articulated high school goal when you last had it. Um, and I think, you know, like Lisa, you have that copy, so you'll be able to cross-reference, or I could sit and go through it with you, but um, that's the level of kind of, you know, refinement it takes in order to bring it to where it needs to be. So if you go to the next one, this is a goal, and Regu, I'm very pleased to hear you speak tonight around some of these areas, and I just want to make sure that you know that they're carried. They're called out under the curriculum alignment in the very first goal where it says enact aspects of the curriculum related to the climate action plan, and the climate action plan, the CAP project, is in embedded there, but these are the facilities goals related to this specifically, and so it echoes some of that. So the one where you saw it earlier at the very top of teaching and learning relates to curriculum curriculum work we need to do to teach about these goals. This is the actual kind of mechanism to put them in place. So this says align where feasible with the CAP uh, goals. And, and I say where feasible because they're very, very um, ambitious and robust goals. We might not be able to align with all of the pieces, but we need to demonstrate the strong commitment, I think, as we already are beginning to, to what we can accomplish for the town and for our schools. So it looks at developing opportunities to increase efforts uh, towards composting across district, working with Black Earth and Harvey's, and there's currently a, a scalable model pilot underway at Armstrong. I would then scale it to K3 and we would you know, be reporting on moving it forward. Um, next, looking at, uh, looking at green initiatives for our recycling and also monitoring and recording our consumption. This is a very interesting goal and it, next year we'll put together a committee that will work on um, understanding the, the ability we have to pull benchmark data and to make our district schools aware of their use so they can reduce and um, track their, their capacity to be um, you know, more conserving. If you scroll down a little bit, you see the greenhouse goal is in there. Now that's an example I wanna talk through a little bit with you. So you notice that that's a pretty big goal. It could have been its own goal with a bunch of action items, but this plan is shaped a little differently. So that's a goal for the greenhouse and the development of a lot of the um, green initiative works related to their curriculum there. Notice over on the right, it says link planning document. So that column over there is going to become an active engaged column where we will link the planning documents which have the detail of the active work and the plans to move forward there as opposed to flushing it out in a lot of action items. So that's kind of an interesting way to see both content where you can get the depth by clicking on the link and also at the same time seeing the goal pretty easily targeted that you can find it. So that's just kind of a management of this document I think will function a little differently over time, which I think is exciting. Um, so then you also see there the articulation of beginning the process of addition of EV charging stations where appropriate at our schools, and we would complete the fails as the first phase of that work. Um, and then if you scroll down a little further, you see that's the data monitoring uh, work that John wants to do. Um, if you scroll down further. So um, the next one right there is, that's the one I want, developing walking and biking options for students and families to safely access all schools. Um, we had really not really articulated that as a clean goal. And I, I wanna thank Sarah for giving me aspects of the language and I couldn't agree more. I think this speaks to so many of the dimensions of wellness and green and um, communication with our, our town and, and community building. So I've put it here and, and outlined the steps that will help us to make sure we stick with that goal. 
Um, have you scrolled down a little bit more? Get that. All right. Um, this is the facilities articulation, which is all around the equity of building quality. And I streamlined some of those and cleaned them up. Um, and then if you scroll down further, develop updated comprehensive capital plan. Um, we need to do, and you've heard me speak of this, but I hadn't put my own notes into the document. Um, I thought I had uh, contract services. To, we need to do a contract. We need to do probably an RFP and go out for another comprehensive WPS capital assessment. The one we have is dated and it will give us a new framework to benchmark capital planning. Uh, I'd like to see it have end of year targets and rough order of magnitude for the first two years of project costs that they you know, give us the first two target years of areas of focus, so we'd have some rough things to work with. So that would be done next year, and then anchor our work in capital projects with clean data over the next five to 10 years. Um, we wanna look at parking expansions and then developing a five-year furniture replacement cycle. So that basically captures the pieces that round out the facilities work, which is, you know, Dave and I are the arm of that work, really, um, and I'm carrying the pieces of it that, you know, are historical, and he's carrying the work of coaching all this work and, and collaboratively with me. Um, so that's what we see ahead. Um, and then the other, if, I think that's it. Daniel, scroll down. I think that's the last goal. Oh, wait, no, sorry, too much to do. There's the borough one. That's um, updating the borough, and I'll talk more about that. The adventure course you had seen before, that was fully articulated in the last draft. The fitness center was fully articulated in the last draft, and all the technology goals were there, but John streamlined them and tightened them down. So if you scroll down through John's, these are all the hardware, software maintenance that he needs to manage for all the devices we run, and he just put it in all the clean language and articulated pieces that he needs to make sure he and his team can accomplish it. So that's a pretty close reading on my part to move the pieces around, to put them where I know I can find them, to make sure that they make sense to most of the people that looked at them. I wanna thank John Green, Daniel, David, Cabinet's so tired of looking at this thing. Um, you know, Sherry looked at it again over the weekend. So um, I think it's in really, really good shape and it's holding the kind of the depth of work that we need to tackle in the next phase of, of our work. So um, I will, from here, send you a PDF of this document, and that will be the standing document that's in this, the, the school committee folder for this meeting. And um, from there, it goes to final polish edit. And um, you know that our last one, you know, had a kind of a more finished look and an introductory letter, and I'll probably modify the table of contents a little bit more and then it should be complete to bring to you at the next meeting for a final vote. All right, thanks, no question. There were also some links that were in, so when they mentioned Capstone, they came back, you could, you could go back and forth. I thought that was so helpful, I know, just guiding. Yeah, I'm thinking that the kind of it being a more um, interactive document is exciting to me and one that we, if we post, people can go look at and find things that are going on. And so we'll see, like that's a new branch of work to use as a document at that level. Um, and I think could, could put more people engaged with it. You know, if that's viable, then we'll definitely do that. And is there a search op option on it? Like I can't remember how I was looking yeah, at you it. Can, you can yeah. use the table of contents to hop to the key oh. sections, but yeah. I'm gonna work with Daniel on it because he's most, more, more skilled than I am around kind of the best way to set it up. I think I wanna put the major goal, uh, I'm gonna put the major goals under there with the tag so people can hop around a little bit, but we'll see. I'm gonna get his opinion on that. So if you're listening at home, when this document comes out, it really gives you a real clear view of where the entire district is headed in all different areas. It is so incredibly exciting to read about the goals, you know, for the next five years because you're, it's so dense in every aspect. So if you're excited about hearing more about what mental health supports are gonna be in place and skills-based learning will take place about mental health or literacy committee, what work they've been doing, or this capstone project at the high school, totally new concept that I never heard brought up. Sounds incredibly exciting. And climate change in all aspects. 
there's so much. Every topic that you can think of is in it. So I thank you for the very hard work and for all the teams that have reviewed and Oh yeah, repeatedly. there's been a lot, of, a lot of hands on this document. So cleaning it up and getting it to look like one singular document was more challenging than before, but I think that's actually a good problem to have. You know, I, I couldn't even track the fonts at a certain point because so many people were like cutting and pasting and putting stuff in. So that's really a good sign of a document that had a lot of people adding in. So um, it can make it more dense, but that's okay. I think you know I've managed navigating the other one. For me, that works, and I'm basically the person that anchors that document that represents the energy of your district and all the amazing people you have here. I just organize the document to share with you and then to remind us what we have to do. Um, and you can see my name falls under key areas where there's actually then individual project work that, that I own as well. Um, so a lot of the green initiative work will be a new branch of our work where we need teams, like we need a, we need a team to sit and do the bus investigation and that's gonna have a lot of complexities to it. Um, there's gonna be new teams and things put together, so that's kinda cool. So, thank you. all right, yeah. yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so we'll it. move. Yeah. So we'll move to our final agenda item, which is a budget update and town meeting preparation. All right. So this is a general news update for anybody listening, but also a couple working points for us. This is just a brief update, and then we will be done. Um, town meeting is in two and a half weeks. This is the stretch between when March 1st turns that corner and the arrival at town meeting where our job as a board and as a staff is really to communicate to the community um, what our budget is, um, our request that they come and participate in voting, and our time to answer questions and to get on the ground to the constituencies who voted you into office to ask them if they have questions about the budget. Do they know that the budget is coming up? Do they understand that we have warrant articles at play? And can you be helpful to them in understanding the importance of coming to town meeting? Um, we need to be clear that it is a nine o'clock start this year, which I'm very excited about. I think it's a smart change. I wanna commend the town moderator, town manager, people who saw that by starting earlier, I think we get you know, a more potentially robust attendance, which I think we hope to see, and a different approach to some of the timing of town meeting. A couple things to note, they will not call a lunch break. People will go out and grab something to eat or bring a snack, um, and they will work through. I think there's a current discussion around whether or not, there's always like dessert, snacks, and cookies and stuff, whether or not we provide a lunch of some type. Um, I'm investigating whether or not I can see if Chartwells might be able to host that and you know set it up. I don't know. I'll answer that this week with Christy. But they're trying to be thoughtful about it, but not let the food process bog down. You know, people are adults; they can make decisions. Let's get town meeting underway and do good work. Um, and I, I think that's a great approach. Um, the other piece of information is that, you know, if you're a registered voter, you can come and participate by voting. If you're not registered, you can come and listen and understand and, you know, you, you don't get an active vote, but you can come and if you are a voter, you should come. Um, I will be visiting Armstrong, Mill Pond, Hastings, Fales over the next week. I'm doing two this week, two next week. I'm talking with people about the budget, doing a tight presentation. They're asking for you know tighter files and other notes. I'm gonna do what I can. Like there's only so many versions of these things I can pull together while we also need Dave and I to work on the town meeting presentations. He's converted it all to PowerPoint, which you have to put it in for the town, which is fine, but it does take some time to convert and now we gotta work in a new you know, I gotta, we gotta play with it, change up some of the slides and do some work for the main presentation if we're asked to address the um, budget. So my job and Dave's job is to do what we can to provide documentation and information people ask for, but, we, but there's a limitation to time for how much we can recreate stuff. You certainly have presentations, you can pull key slides if you wanna do a consolidation and push it out to some friends that says like, here's some key data and here's our slide with our, you know, that anchor slide gives you that budget summary. Um, you can do that on, on your own working with people and I think our PGAs are posting things. So it is an information phase. I went to the senior center, Christy and I had a really great visit there. Um, the thoughtful questions and 
discussion was just as amazing as it always is there. Um, so I'm gonna do what I can to be out <coughs> and about. Um, I would say that the other piece is that we need to present and make a decision on who would be on point for our different articles. So I don't know that we have to decide that tonight. Um, I think you could confirm at your next meeting. I just saw that Christy sent out a notation for the speakers, but I can change it with her relatively close to the meeting. Um, typically, I would present the budget if it's asked for, unless you decide to change that. Um, and then David, Daniel, or any school committee members can help us answer questions. Um, I think that's what we're planning to do again. Um, I think that format is when people seem to act comfortably with, so I was anticipating that I would take point on that one. From there, you have uh, four you know, warrant articles, the Armstrong Playground, the Hastings HVAC, you have the Chiller um, article, and you have the, I'm like totally blanking now, I can like not even keep track of our four articles. Um, Hastings. Thank you. You have the freezer and the chiller and the uh, playground and Hastings. So um, I think that's it. I think that David and I are going to prepare tight slides for each of those warrant articles and um, I think we can share out the presentation of those. Um, so I think that my inclination is that Steve, if he is so willing, might want to take point on the HVAC article for Hastings just because he is the expert of the trajectory of all of that work. And Steve, you know, I mean, I if you want... I, I feel like you're always on point. I, I just, if you want, if we get questioned, I could do the slide overview and you could take all the questions or I could just hand it to you. But we could work in tandem if you're comfortable with that. Yeah, it's, uh, however you want to do it. Um, but obviously we should probably sit down with a slide presentation yeah. for Hastings. Yeah. And, and then I'll dump it all back in you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I think that would be the way to do it. I mean, typically you and I have a good repertoire for that. I'll prep the slides. We'll go through them. And then between the two of us, we probably have the best memory on the trajectory of all that work. So I can list both of us as presenters, and then we could basically take point on, on that. I certainly, Dave and I will take point on prepping the slides, but I probably want to walk through like what kind of if we give people too much information, it becomes confusing. I think we're better to streamline that it's a gap in the funding and we need to fill it and get the work done. When I presented it at Mill Pond, people had good working memory of that. I didn't see that they stumbled through that. And I think when we presented at AFC, they also, you know, seemed to like be clear like that that's work they remembered. So, I, you know, I certainly anticipate that it should be good. Um, so that that's my only notation around a singular preference. Um, if, if people have thoughts, um, you know, Kristen, I don't know how you how you want to proceed. Um, do you want to let people email you if they want to take point on an article, or do you guys want us to prep the slides and you guys can look at them and let us know? Yeah, I mean, you and I can talk more about it too. Okay. Uh, you know, make a plan moving forward. But if you could prep the slides yeah. and the talking points for some of the presentations, then you and I can figure out, like, who might be best to speak. I mean, I'm happy to... Yeah, they're, I just want to make sure it comes from a knowledgeable place. Yeah, definitely. They're interesting articles because they have years of history. history. So, so I think that's where, you know, you can, I think somebody could do a presentation on what, what we're is. asking yep. and what it would entail. And then questions are going to have to rotate probably to Steve and I on some of the historical perspective of how the Armstrong one had been and returned. Although I think you're a strong, well-versed committee, and most people do tend to remember. But, you know, kind of under pressure questions, you can feel like you're trying to remember on the fly. I think Dave could take point on any financial questions that come up about, you know, where's this money coming from or, you know, yeah. what are you asking for and, and all that. The freezer yeah. is like kind of kind of a no-brainer. It's not one that requires a lot of slides. And right now it's coming out of, um, it's coming, it's covered by 
the overlay funds, I think, that they gave, so it's not going to hit the tax. I doubt it'll even be questioned. Um, yeah, I'll do that one. <laughs> I doubt it'll be questioned. If you want to take that one, I can prep the slides no for questions, you. No questions, I'll take <laughs> um, All right, so next steps would be, for people to be thinking about that, that would be the, then the chiller and the Armstrong would be the two articles we would want to be able to think about how we want to present. We have time. Yeah. It just is good to wrap our head around it. Yeah, that's good. Um, about it. And um, I'll start. We already are working on it, but um, we'll step through that. And then lastly, we need to prep our uh, handout. So I think given the presentation we just did, we're in good shape to roll it over. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you know, from the notes in the AFC presentation, but um, Kristen and I will talk that through and start working. I think we definitely need that handout to explain the key content while people are sitting there before the budget comes up. Yeah, and we had a, a few good ideas on switching yeah. that around a little yeah. bit, so. Yeah. Okay. okay, so that's it, that's we'll the prep. Has the Finance Committee given their vote yet on any of these? I asked Kristen, I don't think they have closed their votes with their final meeting. I'm not sure when their final meeting is this week. How about if I put in a, we can put in a call to Mike and get a timeline on that. And I think I read the you. book, sorry, I had to go to the printer like the 14th or something like that. So right. I bet they have a few more meetings. Yeah. They're usually right down to the yeah, end. They do ours like last. Yeah. Yeah, I they do. may hold it until the meeting itself. Yeah, so I, don't I don't think know. it's an interesting, I mean, I think we left the meeting in a place where they seemed pleased with the, the work that we had done. I would think that maybe we would want to follow up. Yep. Had they seen the updated one? We yeah, presented we it to oh, them. Right. Oh, yeah. I watched yeah. you present it. They saw it yeah. first. Yeah. They saw it. it was late breaking so, news to them. I, that was, <laughs> it was. I think that retreat helped a lot too because we could go into depth in the history of these things that yeah. at least the members that were there uh, were appreciative of. So yeah. I think so maybe Kristen, you or I, we could just follow up and just yeah. check in with Mike to see if they are have other questions arisen or do they need us back or yeah. when are they going to vote? Okay, perfect. The Board of Selectmen did vote in favor. They, but no one questioned it, so they just went through the list and it was lumped right. in with the rest of them. It was five zero. So okay. Yep. And good. lastly, I, I should mention Lisa and um, Patrick and Ian and I visited four schools the other day. So you know, I think Ian had done an original tour with me, like my first year here, um, and he hadn't been back in, and he could really see, you know, the changes. Of, of just uh, the work we'd done, and it was good to be back in, and then Patrick hadn't been in. So I think it was, again, time well spent. You get a different depth of question and a chance to visit. Anytime you guys want to tour, it is always enjoyable to see on the ground the building, the infrastructure, the kids, the classrooms. Um, it gives you a different feel for the work. So, all right. was. Extraordinary. Thank you. That's <laughs> Thank it. You. That's the update. Thanks. Lots to do, guys, in the next yeah, two and a half weeks. Lots to do and a lot for our citizens of Westboro to pay attention to and ask questions about and um, to come to town, plan to come to town meeting. Um, so the next meeting of the school committee is scheduled for Wednesday, March 16th, which will be right before um, the town meeting. So we'll have one more meeting. Um, and uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Uh, I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.